Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Good morning. How are you? We are continuing this series on Hello, Holy Spirit. You know, God continues to speak today. He has not lost his voice. He wants to speak, but he wants to speak through, he wants to speak through you, through me. That's how, that's one of the ways he speaks. And so as we're in this series, we're part three of Hello, Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit how we interact with Him, how we encounter God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has many gifts. We talked about that a little bit last week. But it's interesting, one gift kind of surfaces above some of the others as one that is more commonly used, that has significant attributes for the church and for us. And so Paul highlights that when he's talking about Gifts. He's talking about that uh, primarily in uh, 1 Corinthians. We'll be looking at that a number of times. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, he says, follow the way of love. That's good advice, right? Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. He says, hey, there's all the gifts are gifts. They're all great, eagerly desire. But then he points out one, he says, especially the gift of prophecy. He says, this gift has unique and particular value to you that you could use that. Uh, in your life to help you in many ways. And so we're going to look at prophecy as one of the most coveted gifts that Paul talks about. And interestingly, he compares prophecy to the gift of tongues and interpretation. He says here uh, in verse 5, he says, Greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues. Unless, he gives this condition, unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. So he says that the gift of tongues with interpretation is much like the gift of prophecy, specifically when it comes to edification, because that's one of the purposes of tongues, as we'll see. So he says that you have these, uh, you have these two gifts. One is his, the gift of tongues and interpretation, real similar to the gift of prophecy. So you can write that down. That's kind of like the, the little equation that tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy. Tongues, uh, in case you're unaware, is, is not a foreign language. It's a heavenly language. It's a spiritual language. It's a language that the, the, Paul says when we speak in tongues, our mind is unfruitful. He says it's like a, a, a language of angels. Our mind is unfruitful, yet our spirit is built up. But when it has interpretation, all of a sudden our mind is edified. And it has this effect of prophecy. So as I said, we're going to specifically look at prophecy today. Let me give you a one-line definition of prophecy. This came from Wayne Gruden. He wrote the book, uh, one of his books. He's written uh, a number. One is called The Gift of Prophecy in the New Testament and Today. And here's what he says, real simple, uh, shorthand definition. He says, it's a human report of a divine revelation. So that's prophecy, a human report of a divine revelation. Prophecy is something that's spontaneous. It's a revelation. It's something that God's, God tells us. We didn't know it before. It's not based on, so some people say, well, uh, that the gift of prophecy is just preaching, especially those people who say that the gifts don't operate anymore. But this, that is different. The gift of prophecy is not uh, a time of study and preparation and research uh, that would go into preaching. It's, it's something that you wouldn't even know. Like, for example, when he's talking about it, he's, Paul's describing prophecy. He says, two or three prophets should speak and the other should weigh carefully what is said. 
Now notice what he says. And if a revelation comes to somebody, this certainly is not because of careful study and preparation. This is somebody's just in the congregation, all of a sudden, God shows him something. If a revelation comes to somebody who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. So he's talking about how it should be done orderly, and, and, but, but specifically he's showing that it's, 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 it's spontaneous. It's something that God just kind of gives to the, that's why it's a gift. It's not something that you earn, you don't get a degree in prophecy. It's something that God gives because it's one of his gifts. Now let me just show you a few of the ways, uh, the pri- actually these are the primary ways, but the, it's not limited to these, primary ways that the Holy Spirit uses this gift in people's lives the way that it often is manifested and one is through a dream now this is an actual dream you're sleeping you have a dream it's not like martin luther king jr's i have a dream you know that's more like a vision this is a dream this is you're sleeping and and this is very common in the old testament and in the new testament god speaking through our dream life it can be very powerful sometimes a prophecy can be for us when i was a number of years ago i was had already, God had already called me to ministry. I had a pastorate I was looking at taking. I had already gone through an apprenticeship. And then I had a dream. I, I had this powerful prophetic dream. And, uh, and when I woke up, I immediately had this interpretation to the dream that led me to believe that I was supposed to not take that pastorate, instead sell my house, sell everything I own, liquidate it all, get on a plane and come to Virginia Beach, which is what brought me here. It's through a dream. If it hadn't been that dream, I certainly would not be here. Wouldn't, wouldn't have the life that I have. But God directed me here through a dream and an interpretation. You know, that an interpretation also often goes with a dream because, you know, a dream by itself, we've all had crazy dreams, right? We're not, what in the world? Where, where did this dream come from? And so inter- an interpretation is an important part of that. And you see that as a really, as a gift, a gift you saw that in the Old Testament, you have Daniel had that, you had Joseph had this gift of, of interpretation of dreams. Uh, this is an important part of this gift. Often is this, this interpretation. If you don't have it yourself, sometimes you might share it with somebody else and then they get the interpretation. Another way is through vision. Vision comes often in, 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 in like pictures. It's almost like something in your mind. Sharon and I were once praying for this, uh, this young man and he was, uh, we didn't really, he just came forward for prayer and Sharon had this vision of him holding a sword. I had a vision of him having a shield in the other hand and uh, when we started talking to him and sharing this vision, he goes, yeah, I, I told the devil, if he'll leave me alone, I'll stop serving Jesus. <clears throat> and so this, this picture, this vision kind of brought that up. And then he, he you know, he, re- he said, you know what, that wasn't the right response. I need to, I need to, you know, I need to respond appropriately with God's word and, this, and the sword and get back in the, in the fight. So sometimes a vision comes to give clarity, to give encouragement. Uh, uh, it might be an impression. An impression sometimes is just a feeling. Maybe you don't have a picture, but you have, you have this sense that the Holy Spirit's doing something. It's another way. Or a scripture, maybe a Bible verse. Maybe you've been reading the Bible and all of a sudden it's just like, you just, like sent, you just know God is speaking to you through that Bible verse. Has that ever happened where you just go, man, that's, that's, that's right where I'm at right now. That's another way that prophecy works. It can be a word or words in your mind, maybe a phrase. Sharon was telling me at this last uh, ladies' retreat, some uh, young gal had come up for prayer, and Sharon had this phrase. She said, strife in the home. And so she said, does that resonate with you? So I just got this phrase. And all of a sudden, this gal was wrecked. I mean, it was just exactly what was going on, even though that's not what she had come for prayer for. And so the, God kind of gave this prophecy. Sometimes a word can be so, so loud it almost feels like it's auditory. You know, like we actually heard it. You look around. Did somebody hear that too or is it just me? It just resonates so loud. Maybe it is an auditory word, but it can be very loud. And then another way is through tongues. Tongues, as I said, is correlated to prophecy when it has interpretation, but there's public tongues. Somebody generally who speaks in a pub, can can speak in a in a public form in tongues generally has that gift to speak privately in tongues, and that's often a gift that they use a lot. I find it interesting over 
the many years of ministry, so many people have taken a spiritual gift assessment and they come up, you know, a lot of people have different gifts, you know, that, oh, I have a gift of an encouragement, a gift of hospitality, all these. And, and one of the gifts is the gift of interpretation of tongues. And so often people will, will rarely have that gift. I mean, not just in our church, but studies show in churches all over. People giving those assessments all over. That's like the least common gift. According to, these are self-reported assessments. I would challenge that. I think that, that we're just unaware of this operation. That if you speak in tongues, then, because it's happened to me. I speak in tongues, and as I'm speaking in tongues, I'm just not sure what to pray about. I start praying in tongues, and all of a sudden, I get, okay, now I know what I'm supposed to pray. That often is the interpretation. God was speaking through me, and now I have this interpretation. I, it's just making the connection. So often we don't make the connection. It's just like, well, I'm just getting my engines r running, you know, just speaking. And, and sometimes that might be the case, but many times that is the interpretation. We're just not even aware that God is using that gift in our life. And so when we have, when we have tongues and interpretation, which is very common if we're aware of it, that is another way that God uses prophecy in our life. Six primary ways of prophecy that is used. And we use these in our church. We'll talk about these more. We're in an all-church study in our small group this week. So if you're not involved in that, I highly encourage you to do that. We're going along with this series, and we're going to be talking about some of these six ways that God uses and the purpose of how God's use of prophecy in our life, such as the gift of tongues. So what is the purpose of prophecy anyways? Why, why does God uh, go to this effort to speak through us? What is his goal? Well, there's five purposes of prophecy. Number one is to bring comfort, comfort, encouragement, strengthening. All of those things are so important, and God uses prophecy to bring it to us. 1 Corinthians 14, 3, the Apostle Paul says, But everyone who prophesies speaks to men, and I'll add, and to women, of course, for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Now, these three words, strengthening, encouragement, comfort, and the Greek are really, they have a lot of overlapping meanings. But it often sounds like this when it's in practice. Don't give up. Keep going. Don't give in to besetting sin. Don't give in to that temptation. Persevere through this trial. Persevere in your marriage. God will help you. You can do it. And, and sometimes it's a, it's a warning of impending danger. Sometimes it's, 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 it's an, uh, an encouragement for you to separate yourself from something that is causing you trouble. Ultimately, it's that you won't face the world alone. And so this, this idea of comfort, and, and I know that sometimes when we're disturbed, we go for comfort food, right? Or we go other ways of finding comfort. Opioids, are, that's an epidemic in, in our country. Lots of different ways. But the primary way a Christ follower should get comfort is through the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus gives the Holy Spirit the name comforter. That's what he calls him. He says, uh, notice there in John 14, 26, but when the Father sends the Comforter instead of me, and by the Comforter I mean the Holy Spirit, he will teach you much as well as remind you of everything myself I have told you. The Comforter, that word parakletos in Greek means somebody who stands beside you, is, is, is an advocate, is, is with you in, through thick and thin. And so our primary way of getting comfort should not be through food or other means. It should be through the Holy Spirit going to God. And God's comfort, one of the ways that he brings comfort is through prophecy. It's through prophecy in our life. As I said, a big part of prophecy and, 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 and the purpose of it is to bring us comfort, to know that God's with us. And when we speak in tongues, that's one of the great prophetic gifts that just aligns us in such a way where we know God is not distant. He's with me and he's going to help me. I want you to hear the story of a member in our church about his encounter with the prophetic uh, aspect of, of tongues uh, recently in our church. Would you listen to, this is Daniel Davis's story. Hi, my name is Daniel Davis. I'm a member here at Van Community Church. And I remember um, before receiving the gift of tongues, um, 
my perspective was just different. You know, I thought that uh, you had to be someone special to uh, receive this gift. I even thought that, you know, it was kind of weird, you know, at first, um, before, you know, my relationship with Jesus got deeper. I remember when uh, I went to a leaders meeting, I was just there because I was hungry, you know, I just want to get closer to God. And I remember uh, the pastor was talking about, you know, receiving uh, different types of gifts that God wants to give you, but you have to want that. Uh, she said, stand up if you haven't received the gift of tongues and you want that in your life. At first I was hesitant to stand up. I was kind of embarrassed, you know, I've been going to the church for a while, you know, I thought I should be speaking about tongues by now. And uh, so I stood up, you know, because I felt like I needed to do that. And I wanted to receive this gift. Not knowing what's gonna happen, um, you know, we got into groups and people just started praying uh, for me and to receive this gift. And uh, I just had my hands open, expecting something to happen. And um, all of a sudden I started speaking in tongues and, and the, the, the atmosphere started to change. Um, you know, my body, I just can't explain it how I felt at that very moment, but something happened and it was amazing. So I thought that, you know, I, I never could receive something like that, but uh, it happened to me. Now that today, when even when I'm praying alone and having that one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus, um, I, I speak in tongues, you know, to the Father. And when I do that, it's just something that changes. I, I feel like I'm getting closer, you know, to God in that very moment, you know, just searching his heart. With all the things that, you know, I've experienced in my life and the things I've done, I thought I never could receive this type of gift. And if I can receive this gift um, by taking that first step and uh, saying, God, you know, use me, I'm available, then I believe God can do the same thing for you. He wants to give you a gift as well. So I encourage you today that uh, open your arms, be available. It's a great story about somebody just being available. We talked last week about God's gifts or grace gifts, not because we deserve it, not because, in fact, we don't deserve it, but God gives it to us and gave it to Daniel. We'll certainly give a gift to you. You know, it says about the gift of tongues, he says, uh, and Jude, build yourself up in the most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. And so there's, it builds us up, it strengthens us, it gives us comfort. Number two, courage is another reason what God speaks to us through prophecy, to give us courage. And we need courage when we're facing scary, difficult situations. And often this comes in, in, uh, in a way where you'll hear like, you know, be strong. Do not, you don't have to fear. You know, you can confront that, that scary situation. Go to your boss. Confront your boss. Go to that family member. Confront them. Don't let a fear Get the best of you. Don't be afraid of that person. These are often the ways that this uh, a prophecy will come. Spiritual example is from the Old Testament book of Haggai. Haggai was uh, uh, a prophet who comes to uh, the people of God. The Jews in 538 B.C. had had been had left Babylon out of captivity. Had started the temple. They were rebuilding Solomon's temple and. Um, they, they just laid the foundation, and then there's opposition. It's becoming difficult, and then on top of the opposition, they just have other priorities that start to come up. They're, I mean, they have families they're caring for. They have to plant their crops. They have to farm their land. They have businesses to run. All of these things going on, and so they, find, they just stop. And so from 538 to 520, 18 years, they don't do anything. It just kind of just stays there, and, and so Haggai comes, and he speaks this prophetic word to give them courage to continue on. Here's what he says. It's a short word, it's, it, but it's powerful. He says, the, it says, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the, the Lord. It says immediately the people started working on the temple right after that. I mean, think of these four simple words, how it might, it might affect you. For example, let's say you were facing uh, an operation that's kind of scary. You know, it's, 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 you know, there could be complications with it. And you're kind of thinking about it. You're worried. You're anxious. You're trying to keep the lid on it. And somebody comes up, a Christian comes up to you and says, you know, I know you have that upcoming uh, operation, and I feel like God gave me a word for you. You say, oh, really? Well, what is it? 
Yeah, well, I feel like the Lord said, I am with you in that operation. I am with you. Wouldn't that give you courage? Certainly, right? Or if you're facing, uh, let's say you're, uh, God's calling you to go, to go into a, to a, a new ministry. You have to give up a, a fair amount of your financial security. You're taking a big salary cut. You're stepping into ministry, really trusting God on something. And somebody comes up and says, you know, God said, has a word for you. And Well, what is that? Well, he says, in this new transition, I am with you. See, the kind of, this is, this is what happened with Haggai when, he's, when he spoke those words. Very powerful words. Or if you were, you know, in, you know, you're going off to college for the first time. Or let's say you're getting married. And you're standing there and you're thinking, okay, I'm about to say these sacred vows that in sickness or in death, richer or poorer, till death do us part. And all of a sudden, you're, you know, your heart is pounding and you're sweating. And you're thinking, dang, man. And God gives a word through somebody and says, you know what? In this time, God's saying, I am with you. That gives, that gives us courage. So it's these kinds of things that God uses the prophetic gift to bring encouragement for us. And when we face tough, t- tough times, it makes a big difference. Number three, conviction. So he's concerned about our comfort, strengthening encouragement. He, God's concerned about us being uh, courageous, not giving in to fear, but also about cleansing us from sin. This is the conviction part where he convicts us of things that we need to resolve. There's things going on that we're trying to, that we, we keep in the dark. We have pushed down into the basement of our lives. We're trying not to address it. We're trying to, let, you know, uh, uh, hope that it won't cause trouble, but it does. It bubbles up. It's, it, it's, it's spoiling the whole aquifer of, of, of fresh water in our lives, causing it to be bitter. And so God addresses it there in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 and 25, he says, If an unbeliever or somebody who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. So the New, the New Living Translation says they will be convicted of their sin. And that word judged is, literally means like examined. In other words, it's laid out there to be seen. No longer a secret. Verse 25, And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. And so this is a powerful prophetic gift of kind of exposing, putting light on something that we're trying to keep in the darkness. You know, you come into church and you put your church face on and then somebody goes, hey, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. God is good. And yeah, well, God is so good. So he's, he, he's so good that he wants to break you from the habitual stealing at the school, how you're, you're, you're embezzling money there. I mean, what if somebody were, were to, if this gift were to flow like that, wouldn't that kind of, wow, I can't really hide things. You know, things I'm, I'm thinking I'm hiding them. You, you see this gift, for example, like with uh, King David, he has an affair with his neighbor Bathsheba. She gets pregnant as a result of this adulterous affair. Then he tries to cover it up by killing her husband. He thinks nobody knows. I mean, he, 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 he's covered all of his tracks. No, and he's got it totally under wraps. He's fooled everybody, but he has not fooled God. God brings a prophetic word into his life through somebody, and he's exposed. Boom. And he repents. He writes a, a, a psalm about his, 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 uh, his expression of contrition. And that's God's goal. Is this, God shines a light on it out of his kindness and his mercy that it is exposed now because it causes more damage later. I had a dream of a number of years ago of uh, with a past, he was, it was with a, in my dream, there was a pastor in a, lo, in a local church here in Virginia Beach. I'm in this little, I'm in his church, and I'm in this little dinghy. His church has filled up with water. It's almost to the ceiling inside the auditorium. And I'm in this little dinghy, only enough really for two people, barely. And I've got this little paddle, and I see the pastor on the other side of the, the auditorium, he's drowning. I, 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 I go over there and I say, hey man, get in this, get in this little boat. And I wake up. I thought, man, what, that is a weird dream. What's up with that? So I, I try to respond to it and I called him up that next day. I said, hey, listen, I had a dream about you last night. Oh yeah? 
yeah, you know, whenever you get a call like that, it's kind of weird, I guess, right? But uh, he knows, that we, we knew each other, we were friends. I said, yeah, I had a dream about you, and I described the dream. I said, listen, I'm just sensing you're going through something that I, maybe I'm, I'm supposed to help, help you in some way. He goes, I don't know what you're talking about. That doesn't, yeah, I don't, I, that's not me. I said, he goes, if you want to help me, I'm putting on a conference in a couple of weeks. You can come and hand out bulletins or something. I said, no, nah, I don't think that's what the dream's about. So I hung up. Eight months later, I find out he was having an affair with a, a, a gal and on his worship team in the church. And so I was talking to one of the board members about it. They're the ones that told me. I said, hey, when did, wh when did this all kind of, I know you just found out, but when did it start happening? Because they had uncovered it. He said, oh, about eight months ago, right around the time that I had this dream and I called him. Now, I don't know exactly where he was in that process. Certainly something was going on and God was giving him a prophetic message of conviction. He didn't, unlike King David, he didn't repent. And so he ends up losing his marriage, loses his ministry. So many people are hurt. Things could have been different. Maybe if he had responded to it. You see, sometimes we think, well, it's too late now, or I've got all these problems going on. But God wants to uncover it because he wants to resolve some things and cause us from a lot more pain later on in life. I just want to say as an insert, sometimes um, historically in the vineyard, we've referred to this kind of gift operation as a word of knowledge, of one, you know, the gift of knowledge or the gift of wisdom, you know. But really that, when we look in Scripture, we see that the revelation of something that was secret is more associated with the gift of prophecy. You have Elijah, for example, he, could, he knew exactly the discussions that were going on behind closed doors in, in, in an opposing king, the king of Aram. That he knew what was going on in his secret conversations in his boardroom or in his bedroom. And he would tell the king of Israel. And that was a prophetic gift because of that. And then you have Samuel, who was a, who was a prophet, knew the location of Saul's father's donkeys. You know, and nobody knew where they were at. He knew. Prophetic gift. You have Jesus at the woman at the well in John 4. He goes up to this woman. He says, the, he didn't know anything about her. And he says, well, I know that you've been married five times and the man you're with now is not your husband. She doesn't say, well, I see you're functioning in the, the gift of knowledge. No, she says, I see you have, you're a prophet. This prophetic gift. And so we see that more aligned, although there is some overlap, it's more aligned with this gift of prophecy. So we have comfort. And then we have courage. There's God cleaning us up, conviction of sin, and then there's certainty of God's presence. There in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 14, he says, the, hearts of his, uh, the secrets of his heart will be laid bare, so he will fall down. This is kind of like the results of prophecy. He says, and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. So the effect of, of, of the prophetic gift is people have this all the sense God's here, God's among us. And I pray for that for our weekend services. God, because I know we do a lot of good programming for our kids, our youth, our, you know, our food pantry, our cafe, our usher, so many things that go into our tech support. There's a lot of stuff that goes, and that's great programming. But ultimately, that doesn't mean God shows up, that people have a sense of God's power is here. So I view all of that that precursor work to our services, I view that as kind of like the John the Baptist ministry. You know, prepare the way of the Lord. We're preparing for God to show up, but ultimately we want God's presence here, the prophetic gift, so that God, people walk away. You walk away and go, God is really among us. God is here. You know, most of the world lives in a continual sense of God's absence, that he's not around. I mean, you just look around in the world. You look at, you, you just look in the schools. God's absence there. He's not in the curriculum. He's not really talked about in the workplace, by and large. He's not there in the media. Not there. You don't see people making decisions about their money, their relationships, about uh, important decisions they're making, re one, needing divine counsel. You just don't see that. And so most people live day in, day out with this continual sense of God's absence. Now, that's so sad. 
that it's certainly not God's heart. God's heart is that we know that he's nearby. Friend, let me ask you, do you believe in God? You know, do you believe he exists? Not just that he exists somewhere else, but that he exists right here and right now. That he's near you, that he's with you, that he, he knows what you're going through, that he cares about it, that he has power to act on your behalf. This is what the gift of prophecy brings. That's why it's so powerful and so beautiful. That's why we need the prophetic gift in our midst. You know, often we tend to be most aware or at least have the sense of awareness that God's absence when we're in pain, right? I mean, when we're in pain, generally we say, where are you? Right? Where are you, God? Well, all of a sudden, there's this idea that he's not there. This is what Jesus went through when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. We really see kind of this unique aspect of Jesus who's always in touch with the Father's presence. But when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's in agony. He's, it's right before his betrayal and the false trial and the beating and the scourging, the crucifixion. And he all of a sudden feels distant from his Father in heaven. He you know, cries out in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's being swallowed up in this place of, I don't sense being close to the, to the Father. See, the, the prophetic gift speaks into those places of pain, speaks into those places where we feel God is absent from us. And says, no, God is, he's in our midst. He cares about you. He knows what you're going through. Some of you need that. Some of you need to know God knows your name and, is, and knows what you're going through when you're in a place of physical pain or emotional pain, which can be abs is, is, is bad as physical pain, where you have chronic depression or you have some kind of other emotional pain that just, that just causes you to just have all this pain. And distance, and you feel distance. God says, no, I, 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 I care about you. I know what you're going through, and, I'm, and he's reaching out to you. So we have comfort and courage, conviction, certainty of God's presence, and then also we get counsel, good counsel, good guidance and direction. The Holy Spirit wants to give us clarity about what we're supposed to do in life. And sometimes that comes through a prophetic gift, oftentimes. I had another dream. Uh, this was a, a, a couple of years back, and uh, it was about a pastor in Chesapeake. And I had this dream of him just kind of uh, thinking he was going to resign. I hadn't actually talked to him in a number of months, so I didn't know what he was going through. But he had all these obstacles, and then, and then, and then, he, was, then he endured through them. And so I woke up, I called him out, I said, you know, I had a dream about you last night that you were thinking of resigning or quitting, and um, you had all these obstacles, but you're supposed to persevere. He was almost like totally was silent on the phone for a few seconds. Then he goes, I just drafted my, resi my, my resignation letter just last night. I have a board meeting tonight. I was going to resign. And he goes, and, he, and I said, well, this is what, you know, that's what I think God's telling me to tell you that you're not supposed to resign. So he doesn't. He does a 180, ends up persevering through the trial that he's going through. And he calls me about four months later and says, Andy, thank you so much for being faithful to share that prophetic dream with me because that was from God. My ministry's turned around. I'm on fire again. I've seen some great things happening in our church. And, and, and he got some clear direction. The, often we will get direction that we need. It's cloudy. We can't see which direction. Do I turn left? Do I turn right? And we see that the prophetic gift does this. We see this in the major prophets and the minor prophets in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. We see uh, commissioning of missionaries. We see people giving directions on which way they should go, whether they should plant a church, all kinds of things. But when, we're, when it comes to this idea of getting direction and counsel, let me just say as a caveat that the greatest prophetic voice of counsel in your life should be you. Should be you. It shouldn't be somebody else. Sometimes people rely on other people to hear God for them. 
You know, they think, well, that person, man, they're, they're really dialed into Jesus, so I'll let them call the shots. You know, they, they seem to really have a beat on what's happening, what the Holy Spirit's doing. They can get names and details. And they, I can't get that kind of stuff. But listen, I'm telling you, you should be the one through listening prayer, through good counsel, through listening prayer, just through, through uh, uh, seeking the Scriptures to get, the bead on it because uh, listen if, if somebody else says oh i think you're supposed to marry that person and you marry them and that wasn't the person you're supposed to marry when when you when, when, when you get before god he's not going to say well why'd you listen to the you know what he's going to say why didn't you listen to me yeah but this prophet told me no no you, you should have listened to me and so no matter what we do whether it's you know what what church we go to what job we take those that prophetic counsel is more like god's highlighter and like, is, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of sense God doing that. Or you listen to it and you go and you pray about it and you think about it. Paul once was, uh, was traveling to Jerusalem. God was leading him there. And he stops at this city called Tyre. Some other Christians come and say, you know, we've been praying and we sense that God doesn't want you to go to Jerusalem. So you shouldn't go. So he says, thank you for your advice. And he goes anyways. Notice it says, finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days through the Spirit. They urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. He went to Jerusalem anyways. Why? Because he said, well, I, I get it. And thank you for your, what, you, what you're telling me. But ultimately, I think God's telling me to do this. Friends, I've been in ministry. This church we started 23 years ago. I've been in ministry 35 years. I've had hundreds and hundreds of people give me prophetic messages. And, and that's great. I'm glad for them. Some of them are right on. Some of them are not. But, they, but I can't let those direct the decisions of what I do. That's, I've ultimately got to go and hear God for myself. Notice it says, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice and know them, and, I, and they follow me. So God says, I want you to be able to be the person who uh, can go to God and say, is this, is this, does this sound, does this line up with scripture? Does this line up with what God's telling me? It says two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what it says. So he says, when there is a prophecy, do weigh it. There's a, a young man a number of years ago, he wanted to be a pastor in our church. He was uh, kind of working with us in an apprenticeship and, it, and I, I didn't hire him. So he was so upset on his, he quit. He came up to me. He goes, "Hey, I'm quitting, and I want you to know God says that you, there are no more people will come to Christ through this church because you didn't hire me. I mean, he didn't add this because you didn't hire me, but he did add it. You know, I mean, it's, it was reading between the lines. Well, we've had thousands of people come to Christ since then, but this guy was upset, so he was just saying, you know, so just because somebody gives a word and they put on it, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's from God. You've got to pray about it yourself." Proverbs says, in the multitude of counsel, there is wisdom. And so we go and we get counsel and we talk to other people. We bounce it off them. And, uh, but we don't let that keep us from receiving prophecy because sometimes it's right on. Now, let me ask you, if there's a beautiful gift called prophecy that gives us comfort and it gives us strengthening, encouragement. It gives us courage to persevere through difficult times. And it gives us, God convicts us sometimes and cleans us up a little bit or gives us certainty of his presence. It gives us counsel and guidance and direction. Why wouldn't we want that? Wouldn't we say, man, that's like a million dollars. Well, I'm going to cash the check. Where do I do it? But yet, oftentimes we keep it at arm's distance. Paul warns the Thessalonians, the church in Thessalonica of that. He says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to what is good. Other translations say, do not quench the Holy Spirit and treat the prophecies with contempt. Why would we do that? Why would we treat prophecies with contempt? Why over the last 20 centuries has the church often said, no more? That's enough. No more prophecies. We don't want it. Well, the reason is because of the prophets. Because of the prophets. Martin Luther, for example, he was the uh, reformer 500 years ago, the great reformer of Protestant Reformation, shut down prophecy in the church in the 16th century because of one person in particular who kind of was uncorrectable and, 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 uh, and arrogant, a guy named Thomas Munzner. 
Luther ordained this guy, put him into a pastorate, and then within the year, he was fighting with every pastor around. He was creating his own doctrines. He was, and, and Luther would try to come in and bring correction through Scripture and through godly counsel, and he just said, no, I can hear God for myself. And he was just doing, doing wild things. He ended up causing the revolt, the peasants' revolt of 1525, and the pe peasants, he, you know, he got them running naked in the streets and fighting and revolting, stealing from people, all kinds of stuff. Would not bring any, allow any correction to come into his life. In fact, if you look at church history, you see most of the, of the uh, heresies that have come up are because of a so-called prophet brought it out and then would not bring, it would not allow any correction whether it's the Muslims or the Mormons or the Moonies or the Latter-day Saints, all across, you just, these were people that, that would, were, were part of what God was doing through the scriptures and yet they just kind of veered off, would not submit to any kind of authority any, and, and, and they started coming up with their own doctrines and their own teachings. So what I want to do as we close is just kind of give some ground rules because we want the gifts. Paul says don't, just because of there's a potential for error, don't let that from keeping you from embracing this beautiful gift of prophecy. So I want to give some ground rules in the, in the way of beatitudes. You know, Jesus had beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs shall be the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, these are four Beatitudes that I have for our church, that how we implement prophecy. So we want it to flow. We want this beautiful gift to continue to happen uh, in our church. Let me go through them real quick. Then we'll close. Number one, blessed are the humble, for they shall promote God's name above their own. Okay, so in other words, you're not 100% accurate. Sometimes we, see, the Bible says we see in part, we hear in part, we look into a mirror like dimly. I mean, see, he talks about these gifts where we're trying to, we don't always get it right on. We're not, like the Old Testament prophets, creating canonized scripture. I mean, so there's, so if you give a word, you, you first thing in the vineyard, we don't really say, thus saith the Lord, because then it sounds too much like the Old Testament prophets. And so we just say, hey, here's what I think God might be saying. And then if somebody you just kind of leave it to them and, and just say, you know, if this doesn't resonate with you, you know, then feel free to, you know, eat the meat, spit out the bone. Because we don't, we don't always get it perfectly. And it's not about my ministry. It's about what's best for the church and best for other people. So I don't need recognition. It's, I'm just going to humbly submit this word. Number two, blessed are those who love the whole church, for that is God's instrument to save the world. It is an indispensable requirement in our church that every ministry respect another ministry. Our tendency, human tendency, is, is when we get a heart for something, a passion, we get all fired up, we think everybody should be doing our thing. And I'm excited that somebody's that in passion, but not everybody has your passion or your, 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 your vision for that. They have their vision for something else they're doing that, that's reaching people for, and, and, and meeting needs and reaching people for Christ and all kinds of things. And so we want to respect each other's ministries. And, and, and that's vital in the church. We love the whole church, not just one part of the church. And so I think it's wonderful that we have prophetically gifted people and we want them to be part of that. We invite prof prophetically gifted people into the body of Christ fully but we need to respect one another. Number three, uh, blessed are the submissive, for they shall make a pastor's work a joy. I'll put this one in for me. <laughs> I mean, it's always good when people are deferring to one another. Romans 14 talks about this, deferring, lifting up other people. And a prophetic gift is one of those things where we need to uh, where we need to do that, where uh, the, pa the prophets do not run the church. The Bible says that it's the pastors and the elders that run the church. And so uh, if you get a prophetic word, you just, you hand it to the elders or the pastors and say, hey, this is what I think is for the church. And then just let it just stay there. Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so they're that their work may be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. In other words, 21st century language, don't be a royal pain in the neck if you have a prophetic gift. And then 
Lastly, the last beatitude, blessed are the normal, for they allow guests to not be weirded out. <laughs> we have uh, a, a cliche we use here called, you know, being naturally supernatural. Just be yourself. You know, we don't have to be weird about it. We, believe, we, have a, we have the most important message on earth, which is that Jesus Christ came and he lived this perfect life. He died on Easter 2,000 years ago, and he rose from the dead, and he empowers people today, gives them a new life, and gives them a new future, changes everything in their life, heals their families, re releases them from addictions, gives them power for so many things in life. And we have this message that we want to give out in a winsome, gracious, and not weird way in a very in a way that people goes I get it and so Vineyard Community Church would you pray for us to have more of this prophetic gifting I just invite you would you pray that God uses you say God use me to bring a prophetic gift stir that up in me help me not to be somebody who quenches the spirit but somebody who encourages it? Because we don't want to bring contempt. We don't want to be contempt, have contempt to the God's prophetic gifting. We want to embrace it because it's beautiful. It, what happens when we allow God's gifts to, to happen, like prophecy? Well, we get encouraged, strengthened. We get comfort. We get courage. We get cleansed of stuff that's just keeping us and hurting us, keeping us from what God wants for us, hurting us. We have this awe of God's presence. And we get counsel and guidance. It's a beautiful thing. Let's pray for that. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Some of you need a word of strengthening and encouragement. You're in a tough place. Maybe you feel alone. Maybe when I was describing this, this place of pain, emotional or physical, when we just feel distant from God, maybe an abandoned by God. Maybe you're saying, where is God in these things I've been praying for, these things I need? And I believe God's word to you from the book of Haggai is, for some of you, it's, it's a timely word for you. God says, I am with you. I'm with you. You're not walking that alone and you're not going to walk in the future alone. God says he loves you. He's going to come and open up windows that no, and doors that no person can shut. Lord, I pray that your heavens open up. Bring your favor. Break the, the darkness that hangs over the life of some of you. Of, if you're in here and you're saying, man, I just feel so far from God. God, I pray that you shine your light break that fog let them sense your presence that God is in their midst if you've never put your faith in Christ that is the first step you say Jesus Christ come into my life thank you for the work on the cross dying for me and then say Holy Spirit come into my life bring your gifts bring your power in Jesus name amen Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.